Well, um, the foundation is is, uh, is supported by charitable donations, so a big constraint is is always funding. Um, but but I'm going to put a, a little a little note on that, and and that is to say that the average NGO or the average conservation worker will forever bemoan the lack of funding, and, and I would argue that a lot of the times that shouldn't be the biggest impediment. Now I'm not suggesting people don't eat or feed their families, but I. I do think that sometimes there's a lot that can be done with very little. Um, certainly that's one of those. Uh, the other greatest impediment, as far as I'm concerned, is, is the general apathy of your average person. And, and, you know, that might sound very harsh, but I've never made a name for myself for being diplomatic and, and polite. But the truth is that your average person on the street couldn't care less about a dugong or a turtle or an elephant or a leopard. They want to know that they can go to work, earn their salary, come home, feed their families. And, and, and while those are all honorable objectives in life, I would argue that the ability to do that comes because we exist as a whole planet not because we exist as individuals with our own little goals. And until we recognize that, I think we're, we're still going to face an uphill battle. You're, an ant knows that it lives in a community where it depends on all the other ants. And humans have yet to figure out that they live in an ecosystem where they depend on all the other organisms that are in it. And the whole? Part, part of the problem it, well, you could always argue that, you know, there's a lack of awareness. And um, dugongs play incredibly important ecological roles. Dugongs feed on seagrasses. And that's a little bit like cutting the grass at home. You know that if you let the grass in your garden grow very tall, it'll eventually go bad. But if you keep it nice and trimmed, it looks healthy and green and vibrant, and, and everybody's very, very jealous that you have such a beautiful garden. Well, the underwater world is exactly the same, and dugongs play this role of cropping seagrasses and keeping them nice and healthy. Those seagrass beds are where juvenile fish and shrimp grow up, and so those habitats are critically important for our coastal fisheries. Lose seagrass beds, and there goes your seafood dinner tomorrow. And, and that's something that your average person on the street can grasp, I'm sure. The day there's no seafood, and they go, why is there no seafood tonight? Oh, sorry, the, you know, the ecosystem isn't providing any. Well, why isn't it? I want it to. Well, okay, let's protect dugongs and turtles and the other organisms that are required to maintain these ecosystems. Well, I, I'll tell you, I wouldn't have even come to Sri Lanka if I didn't think it was worthy of preservation. Uh, uh, the country is fascinating, <coughs> absolutely fascinating. And it's unfortunate that this first trip is such a short trip. Uh, I would have liked to have spent a lot more time. And, and hopefully in the future that will be the case. I, I would imagine that many of the areas in the north and, and in, the west, in the east are, are pristine for, for, many, you know, for, for, for obvious reasons. And people not going out and, and damaging those resources. And, and so I would say that now is the opportunity to ensure that all development that takes place uh, as, as the country grows is done in, in such a careful manner as to be able to provide for humans and at the same time uh, provide for the environment. So I, I, you know, look, you've got dugongs, you've got four species of, of four of the seven species of sea turtles in, in really nice, healthy numbers. You've probably got one of the last remaining strongholds for leatherback turtles in, in the Indian Ocean. Um, you've got whales and dolphins, you've got coral reefs and fish. You've, 
you know, you, you've got a, one, of, one of the great things as, as you land is everybody talking about the wonderful seafood. So you've obviously got a great marine environment. It, it's, it's the sort of thing I would want to look after. Absolutely. Um, you know, in, in short, absolutely. A lot of people in the world don't realize that the, the funding that's generated to save species all comes from some business or another. At the end of the day, right? Um, you know, Intel Corporation that provides lots of funding for, you know, construct, that's, that's a computer chip, but, you know, and the, the MacArthur Foundation and the, the Packard Foundation, all of these, they're all businesses and, and they're all doing their own thing. And whether it be the oil industry, whether it be uh, you know, a car manufacturer, whether it be a port, whether it be a tea company, are all producing uh, goods, but they're producing those goods at the expense, to one degree or another, of the environment. And, and so I see that businesses paying back into the environment is, is, is nothing but basically paying that environmental tax. Um, but, but I think it goes, it goes beyond that in the sense that um, a lot of businesses probably think that conservation is their enemy. That, you know, trying to save an elephant when I'm trying to have a plantation might not be the, the most you know, advantageous or having a port next to sea turtles or having whatever it might be. But I would argue that the goals of business are probably better supported by good conservation practices than they are without. I, I know that in, the, in, in organizations that, or in, with businesses that I've worked with, I've actually saved them money and, and improved their, their performance because the environment is very good at doing what it does. And it's amazing how bus you know, businesses typically get, or, or premises get built by engineers who, who don't think about things. Uh, a very good example is engineers love to throw light at everything. You know, if, if you need 100 watts, an engineer will put 500 watts just to be safe. And I would argue that probably 50 watts would have been sufficient. And in the long run, that's a, that's a cost savings to the company because their electricity bill goes down substantially. And they realize that, well, we didn't need that, all that light in the first place. If you can work with business right at the very beginning and help them design their business practices so that they, they conform with the environment, you're going to have much more successful businesses. It, it comes through things like um, soil erosion as you build, you know, build on the side of mountains. Trees, plants, all these things can help prevent all of that. So where I want to see green, green is good for, for business. You know, it, it works in both ways. Well, I think it's, it's got the model just right. You're right. You, you, can't, you can't ask people not to feed their families. You can't ask people to give up um, their, their goals of becoming more prosperous or, or providing a better education for their children. The, those are all honorable objectives. If you can do that without it being at the expense of the environment, then you've, you've solved all of the problems, right? So you, having, um, having a happy family, having a happy working community, having a, a, a safe, healthy working community and, and all of those people working in a, in a safe and, and preserved environment. That is the ultimate goal that all companies should be striving for, not, not just the one. I, I'd love to think that the people that work for me go home every day happy about what they do and how they work. Uh, I'd love to think that at the end of my time here, I, I've made a positive impact to the environment in some way or another, to species, to ecosystems, whatever it might be. That, that's something that, that tugs at your heartstrings in a way. Few companies have figured that out. Few companies have figured out that 
It's the human dimension coupled with the environment that matters. And what I've seen so far of Dilma, they figured that out. That's great. Um, I, I would say that that it's not the small, small little steps that make. Sorry, let me let me make sure I've got this just the right way. The small little impacts will have localized effects, but you can have a very large effect similarly with small efforts. Um, we discussed some of those amongst us earlier, uh, but being able to to get the message across to a broader range of stakeholders, being able to get awareness out to people that really need it, uh, a targeted awareness, I think, is, is critical. Um, being able to take a subject such as the dugong, which is in many ways very poorly known in Sri Lanka, if Dilma could make that a national icon, that would be a huge measure of success. The day it's on a postage stamp, the day it's painted on the side of a building, the day the Prime Minister stands up and talks about it, all of those things are going to be measures of success. So, so I, would, I, I would strongly suggest to the, to the conservation team that they, that they focus on their, their, their individual projects, but think big. There is a way to change a big whole country it doesn't have to be with great resources, it just has to be with great determination.